Welcome to the Worldwide Center of Mathematics video series, So You Want to Learn LaTeX. Today, I'll be talking about the basics of the program LaTeX, some of its history, and how to install it on your computer and get started with it. So you may have wondered, how does the Worldwide Center of Mathematics write their textbooks that have, all, that have all these mathematical formulas in them? If you've ever tried to use Microsoft Word to write any sort of mathematical formula, you may have, for instance, wanted to throw your computer through a wall. The answer, of course, and how we get around the difficulties of such editors as that, is that we use, again, the, pro the program LaTeX. Now, while LaTeX may be incredibly powerful and have all sorts of versatility, it's actually completely free and open source. And because it was written in more or less the 80s, you can run it on pretty much any computer nowadays. Before I tell you, but before I tell you how to get started with it, I'll, I'll tell you some of the history of it. So LaTeX actually stands for Lamport Tech where Lamport, Leslie Lamport, was the programmer and mathematician who created it in 1985. Tech, spelled tau epsilon chi, was created in 1979 by a uh, famous programmer and mathematician Donald Nuss. Now, as you can see, I said chi and not x uh, for the x, for what appears to be an x, rather, uh, because this t te chi is the abbreviation of the Greek word techni, uh, spelled tau epsilon chi nu eta, uh, which is, means both arts and crafts and is where the word technology comes from. That's why I'm pronouncing it tech and not tex. Because this is a chi, the actual uh, purest, in a sense, way to, pronunci uh, to, pr to pronounce it, that uh, Donald Nuss says you, could, you should use is tech, uh, where the ch is kind of like the one found in Loch or Bach. Tech was created in, again, 1979 by Donald Nuss as a sort of way to, um, a, a program by which uh, people could, could produce um, beautiful and having lots of complex mathematical formulas, books, uh, without needing to resort to existing uh, and often quite expensive uh, framework surrounding typesetting and typography. LaTeX was created in 1985 as an extension of tech by, again, Leslie Lamport, uh, which, which improved tech's capacity to include user-defined commands and user-defined packages and basically just included lots of ways of extending text functionality. So in order to get started using LaTeX on your computer, you're going to need both LaTeX itself as well as a text editor that is well suited for manipulating LaTeX files because LaTeX files, .tex files, are put into the LaTeX program, but the LaTeX program doesn't actually help you write those files itself. So because LaTeX is open source and uh, the editors for it are also open source, there are, quite a there are quite a lot of different versions of these programs. For an editor, my preferred version is Tech Studio. And for the distribution, because uh, of the complexity of the program itself, there are different versions for different operating systems. For Windows, I prefer the MicTek distribution. For Mac, the MacTek distribution. And for Linux, if you don't already have a version of Tech installed on your Linux operating system, Tech Live. All of these have their, their respective websites linked in the description. So you open up Tech Studio and you get a screen which looks like this. And to start, we'll open up a new document with the New Document button. You can also go to File and hit New Document from there, or use uh, co uh, Control N or Command N or whatever is on your operating system. Now, to start, we want to be able to tell LaTeX what sort of article uh, or what sort of document rather that we're making. So you use the Document Class command. Uh, in this case, Document Class Article, just because there's uh, <coughs> doesn't really matter what, what, what kind we use. So the Document Class command, which begins with a backslash. Uh, tells LaTeX uh, what, the, what the properties of this document are going to be, what the uh, default font size is, what the page size is, what the margin size is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It begins with a backslash, which denotes all commands, and its argument article, with the name of the document class, is enclosed in uh, angular brackets. Now we begin the document uh, using the uh, begin and end document uh, environment limiters. Now we're, we're going to put some stuff in, and uh, I'll explain it all once we've compiled the document itself. So, hello world. And here we have some mathematical statement. 
uh, e to the pi i plus 1 equals 0. So once you've made your document, uh, you go to File, and save as, uh, let's call it hello world.tech. You don't actually need the, the uh, .tex at the end, which I'll tell you in a bit, uh, because uh, the program will just put it on the end for you. That's what all LaTeX files uh, have to be. So we'll save, and now we can compile the file using the compile button. So there, as you can see, this makes it into a PDF, which is displayed both in the document, or it, rather in the program, and also you can find it as hello world that PDF where you saved it. We're zooming in now because uh, we didn't tell it to make it a particular kind of document that has a huge text size. So as you can see, the hello world is interpreted verbatim. The program interp interprets plain text as plain text. As you can see, the space between the hello and the, and the world is preserved, as is the single line break after the hello world, but not the second one. So you can put as many line breaks in between your paragraphs as you want without making that many line breaks appear in the, in the output file itself. Now the mathematical uh, output, the e to the pi plus 1 equals 0, that's in math mode, which is denoted by the dollar signs on either side of it. The E, as you can see, is in italics as opposed to the uh, upright E right above it in the hello, and the same, same with the I. The pi and the I, uh, sorry, the, the slash pi is a command uh, that causes you to write the Greek letter pi instead of the letters pi. There's a space between them in the input file, but not in the output file. Math mode doesn't preserve white space, so you can uh, put spaces around everything. And there you have it. You now know how to make a basic LaTeX document. Thank you for watching this video in our series, So You Want to Learn LaTeX. Click here to view other videos in our series. Click here to, to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any new Center of Math videos. And click here for our website, which has more math resources, including a catalog of our textbooks, which are all, as you may know, written in LaTeX. Welcome to the Worldwide Center of Mathematics video series, So You Want to Learn LaTeX. Today, I'm going to show you some of the more complex mathematics typesetting features LaTeX offers and how to load the packages you'll need to access those features. So we'll start up a document that we said the same way we did in the last video, but this time we're going to use the AMS Math Package. I've copy-pasted this in from another window, but you can have to type it out yourself. This is the American Mathematical Society's package of mathematical commands for LaTeX, which has been standard in distribution since 2005, and you're basically going to want to include this anytime you're writing a document which uses mathematical formulas and such. If you want to use other, uh, if you want to use other features that aren't included in standard LaTeX, you can look up on the internet or in the documentation for your distribution of what sort of uh, other packages you might want to use. Now, in the last video, I showed off a tiny bit of the mathematical typesetting ability it has, but here we put, some, put in some fractions, and you see, I see I've got 1 over 2, e over pi, dy by dx, and I put a 5 in for comparison. So here we see our fractions, which are generated by the frac command, but as you can see, the 5 is much larger than the numbers in the numerators and denominators of the fractions. If we want the 5 to be the same size as this, uh, how do we do that? Well, the answer is that there's more than one way to go into math mode. While the dollar signs indicate text math mode, we can use uh, backslash square brackets to go into display math mode, which I'll be copy-pasting in. Uh, and this causes it, it, it to be displayed centered uh, and with uh, larger uh, expressions that span over multiple lines. So we'll put this in and compile it. And scroll up. And as you can see, now the 5 is the same size as the 1 and the 2 in the numerator and the denominator of the fraction. So let's say that you're doing your calculus homework. Uh, since we have the frac command, uh, we know how to do by dy by dx, but how do we do integration? We use the int command. If we compile this, we see we get an integral sign with uh, limits uh, above and below generated by the subscript and superscript, which are expressed by the underscore and caret in front of the int. Even though it looks like it's saying 0 to the 2, uh, the subscript and superscript automatically map to the thing behind both of them. We can also do sums. 
using the backslash sum command. And again, we use the subscripts and superscripts. This time, though, we put groups around them because they're multiple characters long. The infd command generates the infinity symbol, as you can tell. Now, what if we want to do this in text mode? If we change this and get to that point in the document, of course, we see that it still displays the integral and the sum, but the limits are now not above and below it, but they're rather to the side of it. In order to fix this, we use the limits command, which changes where the, changes where the limits of integration and summation go, rather than next to it, as we'll see shortly. They now appear above and below the, where they ought to be. Additionally, subscripts and superscripts can be put on uh, normal mathematical expressions and even fractions. As you can see, we have y naught and x naught uh, denoted by the sub subscript 0, and also the, the evaluation subscript on the derivative. Now, say you want to do a larger sort of sequence of equations that you all want aligned together. For this, use the align environment, which I'll be copy pasting in shortly. This includes multiple equations, which are aligned via an ampersand and separated between lines by a uh, double backslash, which is a command that makes a new line. Uh, this is also a sort of a math mode environment, even though there's not dollar signs or backslash square brackets next to it. If we align this, we see that the two equations I've written are aligned at the equals, which is where the ampersands are. The aligned environment also creates numbering for your equations, uh, which can be useful in longer big proofs, but if you don't want that, you can change the align environment to the align star environment. This is exactly the same, only it just doesn't have numbers in it. So we can also have matrices in LaTeX. Um, for these, you can use the ampersand to align things between columns and double backslash to separate rows. So we have our identity matrix here, and we use the B matrix environments for a square bracketed matrix. There are other matrix, matrix environments which um, change the delimiters around the matrix. For example, there's uh, V matrix gives vertical lines, that's lowercase v, P matrix parentheses. I'll be copying these, in these in shortly. Um, and as you can see, I've got a short list of all the different uh, sort of matrix environments that you can get for your matrices. So one problem that you might run into is uh, in parentheses in display math environments. For example, if we put uh, parentheses around a fraction and compile it in a display, display math environment, we see that the parentheses don't actually go all the way around a fraction. In order to fix this, we use the left and right commands around the parentheses. These change the parentheses to be large enough to include whatever is within them. So now we, can, now we compile this, and these match to the things between them. And as you can see, the parentheses are now large enough to include the 1 half. If you want to mo modify the size of parentheses or other delimiters individually, you can use uh, specific size commands for those, uh, which are all variations on the word big. So if you use capital B-I-G-G -G on the first one and capital B-I-G on the second one and compile these, we see that now one's too big and one's too small. The ones for the, this just one fraction that left and right commands automatically generate are about the size of the uh, backslash lowercase b-i-g-g -G command. And of course, there are tons of other commands in the AMS math package and other packages, uh, which you can certainly explore for yourself. Thank you for watching this video in our series, So You Want to Learn LaTeX. Click here to view other videos in our series. Click here to, to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any new Center of Math videos. And click here for our website, which has more math resources, including a catalog of our textbooks, which are all, as you may know, written in LaTeX. Welcome to the Worldwide Center of Mathematics video series, So You Want to Learn LaTeX. Today, I'm going to show you how you can format text as easily in LaTeX as you can in other word processing systems, and how to define your own LaTeX commands to make your life that much easier.
We'll start up our document the same way again, only since we're dealing with text formatting, we'll also add the AMS fonts package to show up this, the, uh, some of the math mode font formatting features LaTeX has. Now, if you're using LaTeX for word processing, you'll probably want to know how you can replicate the effects you can get in Word, like italics, bolding, and underline. For these, you use commands uh, whose argument is the text that you want so modified. Uh, these commands, which I'm going to be copy-pasting shortly, are text it, text bf for bold-faced, and backslash underline for underline. If we compile these, we see we have uh, italic, bolded, and underlined ham. Now, for commands which change the size of text, these work slightly differently. Instead of having the text as the argument of the command, you put the, the command in, a, in the same group as the text. So I have uh, the huge command applying only to the ham in this phrase. There are, of course, other sizes than huge. We can have tiny, small, large, normal sized text. You can look these up in LaTeX documentation. Additionally, uh, we, can put, we can format text in math mode, and I'll copy-paste a phrase in uh, with, with some of those features. These are, of course, what we get from the AMS fonts package. So we have the math RM font for Roman. Uh, so we have a upright Roman D as opposed to an italic D that we would normally get. A bold-faced Roman, math BF, R. And then on the next line, some more complicated fonts. Fracture, uh, which is our P. Uh, blackboard bold, so... Uh, all the letters have double lines in them. Uh, for Z, the integers, and uh, calligraphic math fonts for uh, stuff in, say, set, the set theory, uh, which we have the U in. So back in text mode, an important thing to note is that uh, quotation marks only denote closing quotation marks. So that's both single and, and opening quotation marks. Uh, in order to get around this, uh, you use back ticks to denote opening quotation marks, and two of them to denote an opening double quotation mark. Uh, we can see, you can see here that the uh, second instance of the phrase quoted text has the opening quotation mark facing the wrong way. Now in math mode, as we've seen earlier, superscripts and subscripts are easily done. Here we have 2 to the 5 equals uh, x naught. Uh, and this is just done with a caret and with a subscript. Unfortunately, uh, you can't just do you, you can't do this straight away in text mode. Uh, for superscripts in text mode, you need the very long command text superscript, uh, and there actually is no subscript command for text mode that's included in in the default. You can either find some package which has the subscript command, or you can take a sort of a brief jaunt into math mode uh, to make something a subscript. Uh, so we go into math mode, uh, start a sub uh, subscript which is attached to nothing at all inside the math mode, and then use the text command to write subscript uh, as it would appear in text. This is basically the same thing as math rm. So here we have text with subscript. Now say you're writing something in which you're talking about the integer lot. It's going to be pretty arduous to write backslash math bbz every time you want to talk about the integers, and you deserve to have your space in your clipboard open to copy paste something else because you're a nice person. In order to get around this and to make your life easier, you can make a new command to do this in the preamble rather than the document itself, we add the command new command backslash zz uh, designating backslash math bbz. This defines the command math backslash zz to do the same thing as math bbz. If we put this in our text and compile, we see that we get the symbol for the integers. But wait, you may ask, if I can make a command to shorten that expression, well, in this other homework assignment I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of partial derivatives, and backslash frac, backslash partial x, backslash partial y takes a long time to write, but you're differentiating by different, different things every time. Nevertheless, the commands that you can make can have arguments. So if we make a partial di uh, differentiation command, backslash pd, uh, we give this two arguments by putting two brackets after the pd, and then... Uh, use number signs uh, in what the command is being defined as to denote those arguments. You can also make commands which are based on commands you previously made, such as partially differentiate by x, which only has one argument and replaces the second argument of pd with x. So if we put this in and compile, we see that we get our partial derivatives as we expect. 
So now you know how to format text both in text mode and math mode and how to set up your own commands so you don't have to type for miles every time you want to do the same thing more than once. Thank you for watching this video in our series, So You Want to Learn LaTeX. Click here to view other videos in our series. Click here to, to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any new Center of Math videos. And click here for our website, which has more math resources, including a catalog of our textbooks, which are all, as you may know, written in LaTeX. Welcome to the Worldwide Center of Mathematics video series, So You Want to Learn LaTeX. Today, I'm going to show you how to give your longer LaTeX documents sections, titles, lists, and other structural features. So far, these videos have been mostly dealing with tips for writing individual isolated pieces of text or typeset mathematical formulas, but you're probably going to want to add some structure to your document. Never fear, LaTeX once again has a whole slew of commands and options that let you do the way you want. We'll start up an article like usual, only this time we're using the lorem ipsum package so I don't have to write massive piles of text uh, to show you what, an, what a larger article looks like. Now let's say that I want to give my article the title that isn't just some text that looks like the rest of it and without sort of uh, all sorts of annoying alignment commands. Here's how you do it. We just use the title command uh, and, put the, and put the title in it, but this is inside the preamble, not the document itself. Same thing with the author. Uh, I'll say that the author is myself. And also, I can give it a date using the date command. Uh, and the date, we can just use the backslash today command as well, which uh, makes you not have to remember what day it is. Uh, and then in the document itself, you use the make title command. And now I'll put in some lorem ipsum text to show you what, the, what it looks like compared to normal text. And if we compile this, we see that we have the title of the document is large and is centered and looks different from the body text of the document. And then you have my name and the date. Now you can change a lot of things in this. For example, the date is just a text field. You don't have to use today. You, can, you don't have to use a specific date style. So if we say 27 March as opposed to March 27, that, that's fine. Uh, for multiple authors, inside the author command, you use the backslash end command to separate authors. So me and Abraham Lincoln. And if we compile this, we see that our uh, two names are separated as if we're multiple authors of the document and the date is reproduced uh, verbatim. Now, don't, uh, make sure you don't use multiple instances of the backslash author command because only the last one will take. As you can see, King George III is not an author of this document. Now, in the document itself, say uh, you've, get, you've got your title, but you also want to give your document sections. To do this, use the backslash section command. And you'll also see that Tech Studio will, will create a section in the structure, uh, in, uh, in the structure panel for the document, uh, which you can jump back and forth if you've got really big documents using. Here we see we, we have two sections. Uh, they're n automatically numbered, and the section titles are uh, big and bold, as you would want them to be. In addition to sections, you can also have subsections using, as you may expect, the subsection command. Again, Tech Studio is making uh, subsection tabs in the structure panel. As you can see, these are subnumbered based on the numbering of the sections, and uh, the, tit the titles are again bolded but slightly smaller. Now that we have sections and subsections, we might want a table of contents. And to put in a table of contents, use the table of contents command, which automatically parses the doc document for all its sections and subsections and etc. As you can see, we have our table of contents, which shows the, all the sections and subsections and what page in the document they occur on. If you want smaller uh, structures than sections or subsections, you can also use the enumerate and itemize environments. These basically create either enumerated, enumerated or itemized lists. I'm setting up these environments now, and I'll show you what each looks like. Uh, inside an enumerate or itemized environment, you separate the individual items with the backslash item command. Uh, this doesn't have an argument, it, it just makes an item of whatever follows it until the next item command. And if we compile this, we see that the enumerate gives the list numbers, whereas the itemized does it with bullets. In addition, you can actually nest these environments. Uh, here, I'm copy-pasting it into itself to be fancy. 
And what this does is, in, additional, in addition to um, making the interior list smaller, it also sort of changes the uh, bullets or the numbers that it uses uh, to denote each item. So you can have uh, your structures have sort of hierarchical structure. I can see the internal itemize uses dashes rather than bullets, and the internal enumerate uses letters rather than numbers. And now you know how to put structure in your documents. Thank you for watching this video in our series, So You Want to Learn LaTeX. Click here to view other videos in our series. Click here to, to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any new Center of Math videos. And click here for our website, which has more math resources, including a catalog of our textbooks, which are all, as you may know, written in LaTeX. Welcome to the Worldwide Center of Mathematics video series, So You Want to Learn LaTeX. Today, I'm going to show you how you can include tables and external graphics in your LaTeX documents. If you've been using LaTeX to, re to replace your use of word processors like Word or OpenOffice, you may want to know how you can include images in your document. Because a .tex file has to be unformatted plain text to be able to be compiled, you can't just copy and paste your image into the document like you would in Microsoft Word. What you want to do then is first to use the GraphicX package in your document. Next, you want to make sure that the image or images that you want to include are saved in the same directory as your .tex file. Uh, I previously saved an image called duck.jpg into the folder that I'm working in. Now to put the, uh, the image in your document, you're going to want to use the include graphics command, which will be copy pasting in shortly. Or typing as it were. Now, uh, as the argument of this, you just put the name of your file. If there's no other files whose pre-extension name is duck in the same folder, you can just put include graphics duck if you'd like. Now, as you can see, this puts the image in the document, but of course, what I didn't tell you is that duck.jpg is a 1024 by 768 image and is too large to include in the document verbatim. Now, there are a number of ways to fix this. For example, we could use the scale option past the include graphics command. And if we set this to 0 0.3 and compile once more, the image is scaled by a factor of 0 0.3 and now fits on the page. There are other ways to control the size of your images. For example, you could use the uh, parameters setting the width and height of the image. These take dimensions in centimeters or inches, as well as some other typographical units. Let's give it a width of 5 centimeters and a height also of 5 centimeters. If we compile this, we see that, again, it now fits on the page, but it's also squished uh, in that the aspect ratio has to be sorted to get it to fit those dimensions. If we want the aspect ratio to be unmodified, but still have to ha have it to have a specific one of its two dimensions, we just only pass the parameter indicating that dimension, and the aspect ratio is preserved. Now, I don't usually use CM in, in, to denote uh, dimensions in my document. What I use is the backslash line width command, which gives it the uh, length, or as you'll see, a fraction of the length of the typographic line width of the document. As you can see, this image is now about half as wide as a line of text would be. Of course, just including a picture often looks awkward. It's basically just left justified and kind of awkwardly sits in along with your text. If you want to make it look fancier, you can put the figure or the image inside a figure environment. So we go begin figure, and this gets auto completed for us uh, because Tech Studio is nice. Uh, and inside the figure, we put centering to make the figure centered inside the page. And additionally, the, fig the figure environment also allows you to give us a caption. So we'll use the caption command, a duck, of course. And we compile this. And now the image is nicely centered. And because it's a figure, it centers itself vertically because there's nothing else on the page. So in addition to a caption, we can also give this a label that we can use to refer to it inside the pre-compiled document uh, so that we don't you don't have to keep track of all your figure, figure numbers. So we use the label command for this. 
and we give this a key, which is any just string of alphanumeric characters. We'll call this fig one duck. And give us some uh, text as well. And then we can refer to this key, which replicates the number that's associated with the figure. As you can see, it automatically says that's in, that, that it's in figure one. But if we put another figure in before this and the figure number changed of the duck figure, this would now say figure two. Now, if you're putting figures in your document, you can also put tables into your document if that's related to what you're writing. This, this is about as easy. We here make a table environment, which is uh, similar to the figure environment. Give it some centering. And for the table itself, we use the tabular environment. I'll be copy pasting the whole table in because it's fairly large. Now you note the strange string that comes after the begin tabular. This indicates to the tabular environment what the vertical columns and vertical dividers for the table should be. The pipes indicate vertical dividers between columns and the letters each indicate columns. The L means a left justified column, the C means a center justified column, and the R means a right justified column. In the data of the table itself, the columns are delimited by ampersands and the rows are, as you may remember from past videos, delimited by double backslashes. The H line indicates a horizontal line between two rows that you place uh, after the double backslash that ends the row. You may also know that the first space before the ampersand A is empty. This is permissible. You can have empty spaces in your tables. Now we have a table. We'll also give it a caption, uh, calling it a table, and we can give this a figure. Uh, we can give this a label too. Now we compile this, and we see that our table shows up with its caption and with the uh, vertical uh, with with the um, columns and uh, vertical dividers and horizontal dividers as we intend them to be. But you also may notice that the table appears above the line of text, whereas uh, in the document in the precompiled document, uh, the table environment shows up below the line of text. This is because figures and tables are what are called floats, in that they float around the document as, as it's being compiled and get put more or less wherever. Uh, in order to, in order to deal with this you can pass options to the table and figure environments. So we'll put the figure at the top of the page using a T. Uh, these are passed as in square brackets after the begin environment commands. And we'll put, we'll put the table uh, here, which is where, where it appears in the uh, .tex file roughly using an H. There are other commands that allow you to put your floats hopefully where you want them to, uh, which I'll be showing you. So a B will put it at the bottom of the page. A P will put it on a separate page just for figures and tables or floats in general and an exclamation mark combined with uh, one of these other letters will try to make LaTeX um, assign more priority to putting the float where you want it to go rather than trying to make it satisfy certain uh, rules of what it, call, what, what it considers neatness. Getting floats where you want them to go is a really arduous ta task and I've included a link to a Stack Exchange post uh, in the description of this video which explains this, which explains this a lot better than I can. But anyway, now you know how to put tables and figures into your LaTeX documents. Thank you for watching this video in our series, So You Want to Learn LaTeX. Click here to view other videos in our series. Click here to, to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any new Center of Math videos. And click here for a website which has more math resources, including a catalog of our textbooks, which are all, as you may know, written in LaTeX. Welcome to the Worldwide Center of Mathematics video series, So You Want to Learn LaTeX.
Today, I'm going to show you how to use LaTeX built-in citation man management system, BibTeX, which can definitely make your long research papers that much less of a drag. Most LaTeX distributions come standard with the powerful citation management program, BibTeX, which can be used to manage bibliography for your LaTeX documents, such as big term papers, and here's how you can, here's how you can use it. First, you want to make a file with extension .bib that you'll save in the same directory as your, as your tech file that you're making your bibliography for. I've already set up this one, mybib.bib. You can edit this using your LaTeX editor since it's just a plain text file, but make sure you save it as a .bib extension since that's not going to be the default that it saves files as. Now, the bibliography, uh, the, the bibliography file doesn't need any sort of fancy commands telling it, like, the bibliography starts here or this document is a bibliography. Those are all handled in the, in the tech document. Now, as you can see, these are all uh, center of math textbooks. Um, and these are sort of example citation entries. They all have the um, book, which is the kind of document it is, and then a key that you'll cite it by, which is just an alphanumeric string, and then uh, fields like title, author, year, publisher, etc., uh, which denote what goes in the citation for each. These are delimited by curly braces, but you can also use quotation marks. Um, the effect is the same for either. Now, depending on the class of document that you're citing, uh, various fields are required and other fields are optional. You can look at what, what uh, fields are required and optional for each class of document on the internet. Now, as you can see, I've just put these here because I didn't want to type them all out myself. But a way you can get your citations quickly is by going to uh, your web browser, going to Google Books, if you're citing books, for example, searching for the book you want to cite, say, Worldwide Integral Calculus. And go into the Google Books page, and from there you can export a BibTeX citation. This will give you a .bibtech file, but this is just plain text that you can copy into your .bib file. And additionally, sources like Archive and Google Scholar also have BibTeX citations for scholarly papers that you're citing, perhaps. So once you put your bibliography file together, You go back to your uh, document and, well, let's put some text in. And then to put your bibliography in, you need to specify a bibliography, bibliography style. Here we'll use plain. And then you use the bibliography command whose argument is the name of your bibliography file, mybib.bib. And if you compile this, we see that no bibliography appears. This is because we have not actually cited any of our documents in the text, and BibTeX lets you use a large bibliography across multiple documents, but uh, still lets you only show in your uh, references for each document the items that you want to be cited for that particular document. So in order to get what we want to show up, we go back to our document, and we use the cite command, whose argument is one of the keys of the entries in our bibliography. If we compile this, we see this creates a parenthetical citation, and in the reference sections, it comes up with the bibliography entry for the thing which we're citing as defined by the contents of the, bib, of the bib file. If you want something to show up in your bibliography without uh, citing it parenthetically, you use the no cite command. So we'll no cite our other source. And now both of them show up in the references. So as you can see, the plain bibliography style numbers the bibliography entries by author name in alphabetical order of last name. As you can see, Kleiman comes before Massey. There are other styles available uh, for how you want your bibliography set up. For example, uh, unsorted, or UNSRT, will sort your references um, based on the order they appear in the document. So if we compile this, we see that nothing changes. This is because we have to run BibTeX again, and that's only done automatically when the actual contents of the citations in your document change. So to run this uh, manually, you go to Tools Bibliography, or if you're doing it from 
the, the command line you run bibtech on the .aux file associated with uh, the tech file you're working on. Uh, and if we compile this a couple more times, we see that now everything is in the order that appears in the text in that the, the only one that appears in the text comes first. There are, of course, lots of other uh, bibliography styles available that you can look up on the internet. And if you're writing documents which will be consumed by reasonable people, it's likely that they'll be wanting you to use a, uh, a citation style which uh, is supported by BibTeX or extensions to BibTeX that you can again uh, delve more into for yourself. Now, an interesting thing, you'll notice that uh, even though the author fields in the bibliography um, have the names in last name, first name order, these, they're still translated into first name, last name order in this particular bibliography style. If we put one of them in first name, last name order in the bibliography, then surprisingly enough, uh, BibTech will not complain about this. Uh, it's actually very smart about dealing with um, author names uh, and multiple, and th 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 these in the bibliography author fields are only separated by ands. If you have three authors, it'll actually be smart enough to only put an and between the last two in the author field as it appears in the references in your compiled document. Now, because it shifts parts of names around to uh, fit the name styles supported by different uh, bibliography styles. If you want a particular, a particular name to be rendered verbatim, uh, such as Count Dracula, uh, then you put this inside curly brackets, inside the curly brackets or quotation marks denoted in the author field. This will uh, group all those characters together and make BibTeX not shift them around. So now you know how to give your documents bibliographies. Thank you for watching this video in our series, So You Want to Learn LaTeX. Click here to view other videos in our series. Click here to, to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any new Center of Math videos. And click here for our website, which has more math resources, including a catalog of our textbooks, which are all, as you may know, written in LaTeX.